Christmas Eve. Oh no, it's not. It's New Year's Eve. <laughs> yes. You you must have enjoyed Christmas Eve so oh. much. That was oh a good God. show. We did a good Christmas Eve show. It was with John a great Gaines. show. And my whole neighborhood, everyone still has their Christmas lights on. So I'm just losing track of the days. <laughs> but no, <laughs> it is in fact New Year's Eve. And boy, am I happy to be walking out of 2020 alive. Thank you, Lord. Yes. Oh. Now you you are still Angene Slaughter and I'm I still am. Carol Mitchell, but we are going to be new and improved for 2021. That's so true. That's so true. And to conclude our year of the Black Road podcast, um, we're going to be recapping kind of the things and events that have happened over the course of 2020, uh, the impacts that they've had on our communities, right? Uh, and then how we kind of see ourselves, of course, walking into 2021. This is this is going to be a full conclusive 2020 episode. So I hope you guys are excited, as excited as I am. Um, but first, Carol, you got a couple housekeeping items. We need yes, a you know, there's never a dull moment in the thriving metropolis of Tacoma Pierce County, Washington. <laughs> right. <laughs> and it is the IBJ's you know, purpose to keep us informed <laughs> on what's yes. going on out here in Pierce County. We are the black news source of Pierce County. Yes, we are. We are the, the voice of the black perspective on these things. So there are lots of different perspectives and ours is a black perspective. Uh, so um, I have four little housekeeping items, not so little, they're all important, but we won't talk a lot about them. Uh, I think the first one that I have to laugh about is uh, outgoing council member, Pierce County Council member Pam Roach. Oh, what who, is this Pam up to now? She's so entertaining. You know, she needs I, a reality show. <laughs> she needs her own reality show. It would be a hit. Oh, man. Um, and and I and I actually got along with her quite well when I was working there. I was one of the few people she would actually speak to civilly and she would not disrespect me in public because you know we I think we had an understanding. We had an understanding. <laughs> she put the occasion for respect like, on your name. <laughs> you better not mess with a sister. Uh but she has been for a, the last year trying to get the county to turn the county jail, which a portion of it, the old jail in particular, a portion of it is mothballed, right? It's not in use. And uh, she wants it to be commissioned as a, a homeless shelter. So people who are sleeping in tents up on Yakima mm -hmm. Avenue, can just uh -huh. roll their tents up and come on into the back door of the jail and have two hots and a cot. She's actually running an ad about wow. that. You know, okay, okay, Pam. All right, Council Member Roach. I I understand maybe where you were where your head was at. You're thinking shelter, a roof, right? But we don't want to lock up people for being homeless. I mean, even if maybe it's not going to go on their criminal record, right? How do we know that it's not going to cause some sort of trauma <laughs> to be behind bars and to be, you know, I mean, can we talk about the mental health issues that come along with incarceration and you want to yes. offer this to our homeless population? Yeah, Pam, no. <laughs> well, maybe she would consider leaving the doors unlocked, you know, maybe, but uh, <laughs> the whole idea of uh, equating being a person without a house to being a person who is inside a jail, as if being in jail somehow is better than living in one's tent. Uh, you know, maybe in her consciousness, you're right, that you're inside, you're out of the cold, you're dry, uh, services can be provided, mental health and food. Uh, but as you know, last summer, the city of Tacoma kind of tried their whole come into the tent approach uh, down in the Tide Flats, and I don't know how well it ultimately worked. 
Uh, and in that case, they just had some fairly simple rules for people about how they could behave inside the tent. And some folks just were not comfortable with those rules. And I think there needs to be some sort of a transition between being housed and being unhoused something in the middle that gets ready people ready for that new way of living and thinking and being but certainly not the jail sorry uh council <laughs> never yeah. roach not the jail the manny ellis uh initiative is moving forward december yes, 31st yes. is the last day to sign the petition maybe by the time people see this it'll all already be uh, too late but uh thank you to mona Baghdadi who along with some others from the NAACP. They organized a uh, petition signature drive today, or actually on uh, Wednesday. Uh, so uh, hopefully they raised the signatures that they needed to get that uh, moving forward. We're, yeah. We'll be really hopeful about that. F finally, well, two more things. Okay. The uh, <laughs> So much juiciness. The okay. city of Tacoma this week appointed an interim police chief. Did you know that? I only know because of you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. His name is Mike Akey. He had been the deputy chief. He's been with the department at probably at least 25, maybe closer to 30 years. Okay. He seems to have a pretty good reputation among city officials and politicians. I've had a number of people shoot me emails and text messages saying he's a good guy and we like him and you know he's agreeable and reasonable. But I haven't heard much from the community perspective and I'm always interested in that. What, what does the average citizen, especially black citizen of Tacoma and Pierce County think about this decision? It seems like the the city council's all pretty comfortable with it, but you know how they do. Yeah, especially they all... he's been he's been within the system, you know, for so long. I mean, he's one of their own, right? So they have that own that relationship there. But I mean, from the community, I want to know where he stands on issues like community policing, you know, or having police officers from the neighborhoods that they grew up in, if, if we can do that, or neighborhoods that look like each other, right? Because representation is so important and understanding the differences between different cultures, mm -hmm. right? Uh, communicating with different cultures, right? Black people were very rhythmic. We like to talk with our hands. That could be intimidating to some someone else, you know? Um, and so I would like to hear where he stands on issues like that, of course. You know, I mean, the issues that matter to the black community, right? Police accountability, right? Yeah. Well, uh, are you I nine forty? Where are you on I nine forty? And I know he uh, apparently a, a number of these types of questions were asked of all of the applicants, and so he must have fared very well. They had a pretty diverse panel of community members involved in the evaluation process, but I do think that as the interim, he's going to be, it, it cuts both ways. Uh, on the one hand, you're advantaged because you get to put on the cheap jacket and get the bigger paycheck and get yeah, the yeah. get the freedom to make some policy changes. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, there's a lot of pressure on you to do the right thing. Uh, he's still he was a longtime member of the police union, so I think he has a fairly good relationship with the union, but he's also a union brethren, right? Which, you know, I guess you can't avoid that because it's a unionized occupation. So yeah. how are you going to deal with union, union agreements that limit one's ability to discipline officers? Uh, those, are, those are some questions that I think he may be faced with fairly soon. And to finishing out the healing and transformation process that the city is has launched and is it's underway. What is his role as police chief, as interim chief, in ushering forward a whole new way of being among police officers? 
Well, do we uh, know how long he might be the interim, or do we know <laughs> if he has the same amount of authority as a, someone who was the standing or sitting uh, police chief? I think he would. Yes, as the interim, he has all the powers of of a, a regular chief, and he only he reports only to the city manager not to the mayor, not to the city council. So remember, they only have one employee and that's the city manager. So it'll be the city manager, Elizabeth Pauley's job to set expectations, to evaluate his performance, and then ultimately to bring forward a proposal as to whether he should become the regular police chief. So we'll see. There's no time, there seems to be no specific time frame for it. Uh, but I think they wanted to get a decision made in this year mm -hmm. so that people wouldn't be wondering. All right. Well, All right. Time, Aiki, yes. we're watching you. We want to make sure we're watching. You, <laughs> you're making the right calls, okay, and that you're standing by uh, your words, right? Hey, maybe we'll get him on as a guest and we'll oh. be able to ask our questions directly. We can follow up on that. And then finally... Okay. I think the I think the event of the week has been the takeover of the Five Travel Lodge. The by, takeover number two. <laughs> okay. I mean, it's what I think the need for housing reform and for more affordable housing and low income housing in Pierce County has gotten to such a state that activists like Tacoma Housing Now and Food Not Bombs and people who are houseless have just said, to heck with it. We're just going to take over spots that seem to yeah, have some vacant. vacancy. We're just... <laughs> yes. Now so that's what they did. They went down to the travel lodge in Fife and, and just took over. And mm -hmm. apparently the owner is outraged, of course. <laughs> understandably. And one story I read said, hey, maybe the city of Tacoma can pay our bill because now folks are out of the weather, out of the cold. And so let the city of Tacoma use some of their CARES Act money or some of their human services money to pay the bill. Well, so you know, taking things into their own hands, Anjanae. They sure are. They sure are. And they're being consistent with it. But if I can recall correctly, when they you know, showed up at uh, Mayor Woodard's house. What Mayor Woodard did promise a conversation, um, you know, for a, for a few of the demands, not all the demands, you know, especially nothing regarding defunding the police, but she did, you know, say, hey, send me an email. I will respond to you by Wednesday of that week. Or, you know, I wonder if that, if they've started having conversations they, and if maybe an ask did. like this, would uh actually be something you know manageable i don't know they had a, they had a meeting and I, I was trying to find uh where it is in my notes because i actually attended it the oh. safe safe shelter summit on december 21st she was there and she said i'm here to listen um also a lot of uh housing providers were there, social service providers were there, Keith Blocker, council okay. member Blocker. And so they sat and listened to the demands uh, that were summarized by housing providers of what they want from the city. And so there's a whole list of those that I'm sure the, the city is uh, trying to figure out how they do it in a time yeah. frame when sales tax is down, B&O taxes are down. I don't know how they fund it. Well, what about uh, the new stimulus package that's uh, come, that was already, there was a bill uh, already passed the House and the yes. Senate, right, to mm -hmm. bring state funding uh, for COVID relief. Now, this isn't the stimulus check. I know everybody, we're going to talk about the stimulus check, uh, but this is not the direct deposit to your- Did you already get your account. $600? I haven't got mine. <laughs> I'm waiting for mine. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah, Christmas knocked me out. I'm, ready. I'm waiting for mine. <laughs> I don't think you're going to get the 2000 because uh, Mitch McConnell has basically said no. No yeah. way that's going to pass the Senate. But the Trump $600 is check is supposed to be on their way. Yeah. 
Yeah, IRS released a statement saying that some direct deposits have already been initiated. They said, um, you know, the official date is until January 4th. So don't freak out until January 5th if you haven't received anything. Yeah, but, uh, and our own Governor Inslee also mm -hmm. said, hey, we'll, we're going to fill the gap in between for folks who were on unemployment, they, they're, they're gonna have some state benefits made available to sort of fill that gap in between the stimulus, federal stimulus and the, cause I think unemployment benefits stopped last week. Was the last week, last Sunday was the, was the final cutoff date, but I'm just excited that you and I are still here in spite of everything that happened. Let's just kind of recap. Can we recap oh, yes. 2020? Let's let's recap. Well, let's start. <laughs> well, you know, I started 2020 in Ghana. Oh, I yeah. was gone. I was there until January 22nd, and when I came back, all hell was breaking loose. <laughs> Man, listen. When I got on the flight in Accra, Ghana. They were checking temperatures for COVID then. Mm. When I got off the flight in New York and onto the off the flight again in Seattle, no temperature check. So what did Ghana know on January 22nd that the U.S. didn't know or didn't believe? I don't know, but I thought Af like in Africa, <laughs> it was resist. I thought COVID wasn't in Africa. <laughs> Because of the heat, <laughs> no. a lot of people were saying COVID. Oh my God! I had people telling me foolishness like, "Hey, the melanin in your skin makes you naturally resistant." Oh, that man. is but not seriously, true. The beginning of this of this pandemic, people were saying since there was no black people that were coming up, you know, positive. They were saying, "Oh yeah, it's it's the genetics." in black, you know, in our pigment that's keeping us. I mean, there was so oh. many different just rumors. It was, it's kind of funny. Yes, miss, <laughs> miss information out there about that. But I mean, a lot of uh, countries like, I know Thailand, uh, they had very few actual deaths. I mean, less than like 20 or something, really small. Yeah. But there are countries where people are accustomed to doing what their government tells them to do. So unlike the US where we're so individualistic and you can't tell me what to do because I'm grown. Yeah. If uh -huh. I want to carry my gun into the county city building, yeah. you can't tell me I can't, right? Yep, yep. Mm -hmm. we, we, if we I don't want to wear a mask. I mean, if I don't want to wear a mask, if I don't want to take a vaccine, if I don't want my child, to uh, yeah. have a vaccine of the immunized, I can decide that we have the freedom. But in countries where people are accustomed to doing yeah. what their government says, no, that makes a lot of sense. You had less of it. So Ghana has had; they have had. Africa's had some cases, mm -hmm. um, but they spend a lot of time outside, right? Out of the because it's hot. Yeah, and in some places. <laughs> They have no air conditioning and they have no electric yeah, electricity. Air. So, you know, the windows are open and fresh air is yeah. coming in. So that helps. But what else about COVID impacts oh. do you remember from this year? Well, the biggest thing that really strikes me when it comes to COVID is how it just stopped everything. I mean, mm -hmm. when Governor Inslee put down that stay at home order, what was it, March 23rd, where it was like official, you have to stay home unless you're going to the grocery store, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's when it really sank in. I'm like, oh my gosh, we're on a lockdown. You know, this is a real thing. We have to quarantine. You know, there was a slight panic that kind of spread mm -hmm. across the town, right? The city, you know, nobody wants to go outside. Everyone's freaking out. I know some people were... <laughs> like 52 days inside. I mean, it's, that is just, but it just really did slow things down. Um, and it opened our eyes to disproportionalities that were already mm -hmm. current, but now they were just heightened, mm -hmm. right? Because of the COVID, because of the pandemic, right? We saw that even during a pandemic that 
you know, our community, we're still facing this epidemic of police brutality, you know, and just wrongful injustice, right? But it, it didn't only highlight it to our eyes because we're black. We know this. It, it's a constant mm-hmm. fear. It's innate, right? It's just, it's it's natural for us to, to kind of feel the eyes of people as they stare at us when we walk into convenience stores, you know, or to get nervous when you get pulled over by the police. That's, that's normal right. for us. But, we, but now we see other communities because they don't have anything to do but watch the news, right? Because they're mm-hmm. quarantined, right? Mm-hmm. So now they're getting involved. I mean, we saw, we had so many white allies that really stood up and, and protest. I mean, this summer, we had over 30 days straight of physical protests, you know, marching. And, and a lot of, I mean, a mo- some of them were predominantly black, but I would say more so were, were those allies, you know, and not even just white, but you saw our Asian allies coming in, our mm-hmm. Samoan allies, you know, people of all different ethnicities, because like the IBJ knows, right? If you can do this to the black people, right? <laughs> I mean- You're just one step to the right, one step right? step also to the next, exactly. And so we have to nip it at the butt. We cannot, uh, you know, allow for this injustice. So. That's what COVID really did for me. It really. How about Seattle? Seattle went crazy this year, though, right? Seattle, like Seattle, Seattle will up. never no, be the same. No. Seattle stood up. We had we had physical protests. We had Chaz. Oh my goodness. Chaz and Chop and Chop. I've never in my whole life living in Seattle. I mean, I'm born and raised Seattle, King County, right? Mm-hmm. Never have I seen a, that sort of protest, a, a sitting protest. And this is this brings you back to the peaceful, you know, at first, the peaceful protest of MLK, right? Mm-hmm. When he's sitting in at the lunch, t- lunch counter, the white only lunch counter, like he's making that physical stance. And that's what those um, protesters were doing, you know, and it wasn't until the media started, you know, kind of colluding the narrative and then you see gang violence that also mm. distracts from the mission and the purpose. But really, the 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 root of Chaz and of Chop, right, of that Capitol Hill, right, occupied protest is what Chop mm-hmm. stands for. Right. Then they, then they changed it to mm. Capitol Hill. Um, what was it? Activist Zone or something? Is that what? Yeah, I I don't know something which one like came that. first, Chaz or Chop, but yeah, but. I mean, yeah. it cost, it basically cost the city of Seattle its police chief, its black female police chief. Uh-huh. And Jenny Durkin, mayor, has decided she's not running she for running. office again. <laughs> she is running. She ain't running. No, I have that some away. friends that are, <laughs> yeah, I got some friends that are big activists in Seattle. Shout out to all of you guys. And uh, we, they came with the hard questions and, you know, like, the funds, I mean, Durkin sat down, you know, with a group, you know, of maybe 20 activists, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And and she would do these things and you think that we're moving along, you think that we're getting some progress, right? And then when it comes to uh, the funds, right? Or, or why we can't have Chaz, I mean, the actions were completely opposite of what, you know, she would say in those well, conversations. Well, she, she, I think people discover same in Tacoma with the Manielis matter. People discover that mayors really can't do as much as we think they can. They have a city council that basically they have to get at least four people to agree with them uh, on whatever they're trying to do. So she may have wanted to keep every commitment she made but I don't think she was on very good terms with her counsel. And then in Tacoma, like we said earlier, if Mayor Woodards had wanted, for example, to fire the four police officers involved with Manny Ellis's case, she can't do it really. It's, it's Elizabeth Pauley's job. It's the city manager's job. And everybody knows that Elizabeth was in the city attorney's office for 25 years 
prosecute Gates. Right, well, he worked not, hand in hand with the police. I'm not saying that she can't be objective about it, but she's a lawyer and she's going to make sure every I is dotted and every T is crossed before she makes a decision like that. She's just not going to jump into it. But I, I think the Manny Ellis case here locally has been, you know, that was a landmark moment. And frankly, it almost went by unnoticed in some ways because it happened in March mm-hmm. and it really didn't blow up until May. Yeah. In between is Brianna Taylor, George, George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery's cases, right? That were sort of picking at this scab of racism and by the time the results came back for Manny's case that thing you know was infected right people were going wait a minute we need some penicillin like is this happening right here no I mean we're used to hearing this in Michigan or you know right no this and is, today we heard, uh, we heard, or this week that Tamir Rice's case, you know, mm-hmm. no charges filed. And this was a 12 year old child yeah. playing in the park. Now, if you can't send your 12 year old child to play in the park as a parent, right? How that's a sad you? state of affairs. Um, what about the fact that though, in the midst of all of this turmoil and disruption, a whole lot, a lot of Black women are now yeah. in office. Yeah. What are your thoughts about that? That's amazing. It's historical. You know, I mean, this is going down in the history books, not only for Washington State, but for the whole country. I mean, we don't have to talk about the president-elect and the VP, right? Come on. Oh, Harris. my gosh. I know. <laughs> that That in itself, I mean, we're... We're breaking ceilings, glass ceilings, left and right. But here within our state, I mean, it's so uh, inspiring um, to see just numerous. I don't, I can't even count. I think it was over five real new, new elected, um, and then a few reelected black women into our house, uh, and then our first blacks. You know, our well, our 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 one black. Senator, right? <laughs> Tawana um, Franklin. Nobles. I mean, nobles. Mm-hmm. Nobles, mm-hmm. excuse me. Tawana yeah. Nobles. Yeah. Uh, so it's just that that in itself, representation is so important. And I'm so passionate about it, especially given that this is the line of work that I'm in, right? Mm-hmm. I'm in social work. I'm in politics. I'm, so I want to see more people that look like me in these spaces. Um, and then we had a baby. And that's course. part of the good news of 2020. Yes. Um, you know, uh, it's Kwanzaa week. Kwanzaa. And by the time people see the show, uh, we'll be on almost the last day of Kwanzaa. And of course, the last principle of the seven is faith. Mm-hmm. And uh, one of the principles is Nia, purpose. And you and I, back in, was it when was it? Maybe June? It had, we, it had to be. We this had summer, our, really our organizing meeting. Uh, we had our organizing meeting at the Country Rose Cafe <laughs> in downtown Spanaway, Washington. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yep, we sure did. We sure did. We, we, man, put some visions on the table. We just discussed an idea. The IBJ, it just came from this idea and this need right? This, the lack of connection uh, for the younger generation, the passionate, you know, influencers, the social changers, right? We saw there wasn't this connection there. Uh, And then we also saw the need for support for our community uh, because we are just so disproportionately targeted, uh, attacked, and oppressed in so many different systems, right? But but the, the, yeah, go ahead. Your Carol. purpose, right? We, you and I, this year, were, I, I, you know, some people plan their lives so beautifully 
and just seemed to seamlessly walk into their purpose with very little struggle. This was a year when I got shot out of a cannon into my purpose. <laughs> I know they did you wrong, Kara. I'm still ta- I'm still thinking, man. But, did but, you but look at the result of it. You know mm-hmm. what they meant for evil, God meant for good. Yes. Their yeah. attempt to destroy my character, my reputation, my source of income mm-hmm. has blossomed into this beautiful vision, this baby that you and I carry called the Institute for Black Justice. And guess what? Other people think it's cool too. Not just you and me. You know how people sometimes will say, oh, that's such a cute baby, but yeah. really it's ugly. You yeah. know, you know. <laughs> just to be nice. Yeah, we've all been there. <laughs> For us, we have people who have, I mean, they have put their money where their mouths are. Some of them have been volunteering their time and energy and effort. But you and I, um, at some point, you know, we're going to have to maybe clarify where we really want to focus our energy because people are asking us to do so many interesting things and we don't have the bandwidth to do it all. And, you know, we're Huskies, so we want to do everything we do with excellence, which means you can't do everything. No, we need to, we'll definitely kind of narrow our focus. Well, we know that we have our leadership symposium, that's not gonna change. That's a pillar of what the IBJ is all about, seriously. Um, we'll, we still wanna connect with our direct family, you know, advocacy work, but, yes. and, you know, cause that is so important too. That's how we can make, you know, direct change uh, and impact. On well, I am so excited too about our potential partnerships with University of Washington Tacoma, with evergreen tacoma with evergreen main campus they are almost as excited about the symposium as we are and guess what you know we did a little fundraiser Mm -hmm. that'll run through december 31st so by the time people see this uh they can still give if they want to though but we are are more than halfway there they'll have six hours left (laughs) <laughs> that's right but yeah. we're more than halfway there you know we were just doing a small little fundraiser to cover the cost of all of the young people 18 to 35 that we want to participate we don't want the participants to have to pay for anything we just oh. want them to come and we want to give value to what they know what they've experienced what they've lived they are experts on what their life has been like. Nobody can tell that story better than they are. So we're gonna pay for their expertise on what their life has been like, what they know they need, and tap into that youthful creativity to figure out what we can do to solve some of these issues that they face. Seriously, and you know what we're doing, Carol? We're setting a standard. For anyone else that wants to do some sort of symposium, if you're if you really want to bring people, I mean, we understand and respect others' time, uh, right? And we mm-hmm. know that the time that they have to take to give to the community, you know, takes away from any other time that they could be using to, you know, put, you know, feed their kids or make sure that they can secure their housing. So it's so important that we give back to them. Uh, that's the standard. Okay. It is. It is. Community knowledge and the information that they bring mm-hmm. should be paid for the same way you pay any other expert. Mm-hmm. They're an expert on their own lives and their own community. So why do you think they should just give you their knowledge and expertise for free? For free. It's an equity issue. Mm-hmm. And it's the reason I hated when I was in roles where I could determine I hated unpaid internships for young people yeah. because mostly people of color had to have that income. If it was a summer in- internship, mm-hmm. that's when they made their money for the rest of the school year. And so they couldn't afford to just come and get the credits. I recognize right. the credits have a value, but 
the credits don't buy groceries. No. They don't pay for gas in your car. So I don't think anytime we put effort and energy into something, it has a value and we should compensate people for it. And I know that's a radical idea because the, no. gov the government wants you to show up and give out your knowledge and information and sit on committees and, you know, yeah. whatever for free. The government doesn't include that backstory right? The equity lens, that's what the government's missing, right? The fact that in order to give civically, I have to be able to first take care of my household. That's right. why you don't see people in poverty involved or engaged. They can't show up at the council meetings, you know, during the day because they're working, right? They're not stay-at-home parents, you know? So this is just the kind of logic that that sort of thinking, that individualistic thinking, mm -hmm. um, why it's so problematic. You know, it doesn't. And I will, I will say one thing too. I think sometimes it's intentional that we set things up in such a way that they accomplish exactly what they're intended to accomplish. So if you don't see participation of Black folk on committees and commissions, well, you've set it up in such a way that it's it's accomplishing exactly what you set it up to do. So if you're having a council meeting at 12 o'clock at lunchtime mm -hmm. and you expect people to participate, most folks who are working during the day are right. not gonna use their time to sit on a call for three hours waiting to have three minutes of conversation. It's set up to ensure that only people who can really afford to spend their time doing that or who get paid to spend their time doing that mm -hmm. will participate. Yeah. We yep. are going to do it differently. Absolutely. We're going to we're going to our organizing principle around what we do is to be human centered and think about what we're doing from the standpoint of the person participating. What makes it easy for them to participate? Right. And that's what we're going to design during the symposium. I love it. Human-centered. We want it to be accessible mm -hmm. and inclusive. Mm -hmm. Right? Very uh, much human so. Human-centered, though, that's perfect because this is these are my people. They look like me. I would love to have, you know, <laughs> we're going to have music that is going to be able to, you know, <laughs> relate to our generation. Um, and then, you know, Karen, we'll throw some, we'll throw some oldies in there too, you Thank know, you. Thank give you. us a perspective. Yes. Yes. Uh, so why don't we wrap up with just a real quick nod to, uh, Kwanzaa, the last day of Kwanzaa to the importance of faith, the importance of having a very clear purpose cooperation is you know oh, yeah. those are some of the organizing principles in unity. Kwanzaa. unity right self-determination all of those principles matter and help hold a community and a society together so happy new year to you and to everybody that's viewing our show everybody that supported us financially who yes. clicked the like button even yes. that Thank you, thank you, and Happy New Year. Happy New Year, everyone. Absolutely. We are walking out of this new year with faith on our side, okay? We have faith that we'll get through this pandemic. Uh, we have faith that our community will all stand together, empower each other, and uplift each other. Let's make some progress in 2021. Um, I, I just want to wish you all nothing but blessings. You, Carol, this, the IBJ, we're taking off in 2021. Yes. <laughs> okay, we're, we're, we've already achieved so much in just our first quarter, guys. We've been able to raise $30,000 in our first quarter of our, uh, of our baby. So yes. that, that is just amazing. We want to keep this momentum. The funds that we raise are going to go towards uh, the different projects and programs and of course our leadership symposium. So it's going right back in, into the community uh, that looks just like us. Um, that's uh, it for us. Well, that's go have some fun. It's yes, still early I, enough. Go have some fun. I'm going to have grandkids so other okay. folks can have fun. I'll be uh, Nana. 
<laughs> New Year Nana. So I'll see you all next week. I'm Carol Mitchell. I'm Angie Nay. See you in 2021. Bye.